Welcome to the 25-8 podcast where we have part two, dose. Deuce. Were you going to say deuce or dose? I was waiting for you to say it. Oh, Peace. of our uh, wonderful and amazing conversation uh, with Jack Kugel and our special guest, Mr. Jimmy Jimbo James Reynolds. Woo! Um, I, uh, I hope you liked part one and there's no need for us to do like this big extravagant intro. We just want to say, um, if you want to record here, you can talk to Jimmy, reach out to him at the stew, the stew.com yes. or, uh, two, five, eight studios.com or on Facebook, it's 25, eight studios or on Facebook, it's the stew. And without hearing this, then you might want to listen to all of this stuff so you can have your plan in order before you decide to get into the music business sure and then um i would like to say that i know that at least from stacy um myself and uh, uh jimmy behind the scenes we're incredibly grateful jimmy's grace gracious enough to uh you know help us out doing this every week even though he's not always on i think he's one of the most funniest um talented uh, talented sincere people uh behind the board and mm-hmm. in front of it mm-hmm. so um and having these two on this it was awesome. and rock yeah, and roll and, it was great um so uh let's get to the intro do the michael mcdonald i can't forget i'm not in love anymore baby <laughs> <laughs> now, if you, if you actually stick your fist and put it in your mouth while you're doing that, it actually sounds more like it. He's <laughs> um, so a running joke here. We oh, did, I love it. We did that, and even though... Out of nothing but love. That was around the time I started to learn that there's going to be songs that I write that may not be a big success, but I'm still very proud of them. They right. still, you know... I can get up today and I can write a hit song. I can't guarantee it's going to be a hit. Right. I Once it's out of my hands, it's got to go through the right promotion avenues it's got to catch a bit of luck yeah. you know you might write a song called she oh sheila and if the head of promotions wife sheila was caught fucking somebody else and he's mad at her oh sheila's not getting on the radio oh shit <laughs> so the strangest things that's once songs leave our hands and that's why i was i feel like all those other jobs i had helped prep me for what happens to my music when it's out of my hands because i worked at Hitmakers and had radio relationships i was able to pick up the phone and call radio programmers around the country when i had a reason to um and say hey do me a favor check out this song it's not i don't see it on your playlist yet i wrote it check it out i'm proud of it you know, whereas normally in order to talk to those guys, you have to call on a Monday or Tuesday if you're a record promoter and you're you're just lumped in with those guys. Right. And what I learned is I don't know how many people grew up dreaming of being a program director or a DJ. Not many. Most of them wanted to do what I'm doing or be the star. Right. But they settled on these peripheral jobs. So anytime right. you can reach out to any of these folks and they get a call from someone who's in the creative process they're they're much more willing to talk to you than if you're a hired gun for a promotion department at a label. Yeah, I'm calling I'm calling representing blah blah blah. Right. Like they're just like I don't fucking care. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's go put it in the pile with the other 30 records I have to listen to. Well, that's smart though. Well, I mean, uh, part of the reason like what, why we do the podcast and 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 we're we're absolutely pleased and honored to have you here is is to give you know, a little insight to like up and coming musicians or to, to up and coming engineers or, or people who want to get into it. Like a lot of people think that like, you know, like we, we like around here, the hip hop guys who are like, like God bless them. Like some of them are phenomenal. Some of them are not, mm-hmm. but they're like, um, all right, we have to master today because it's going to be on SoundCloud at five o'clock tonight. And you're just like, but why, where's the plan? Where's yeah. the plan to get it yeah, out they're, there? Mm-hmm. At, like they're you, they're you saying just these just arbitrary, arbitrary deadlines for themselves and then you're compromising quality right i've always operated from a place and i do this with my whole life not just music but i need an end zone right and i need a game plan to get from here to there Mm -hmm. and if i'm doing lateral moves i'm not getting from here to there so you know when someone comes to me with an idea for a project the vetting i do is Okay, great. How? What? What is the end zone? What do you want? You want? You are we doing this because you want to get signed to a major label? Or you want to put it out yourself? And 
what do you do to intend to get there? What's your game plan? And if there's no game plan, it's a waste of time for me. How often do you have the people who don't have a game plan? Every day. Every single day. And you mean that with zero sarcasm or irony? Zero sarcasm. There are so many people that have good intentions. They want to be this. They want to be that. They want to do. They want to be a star. Yeah. Good. How are you going to get there? I'm going to take my money and make a great record with great people. And I'm going to put it out. And if it's great, it's going to become a hit. Oh, really? Do you know how radio works? <laughs> Time they, to pop the bubble. No, they don't. Yeah, let's pop so, the bubble. So to pop the bubble, basically, the worst thing that can happen to you is to have a hit record with no money and no game plan. Why? Because let's. I'll try to break it down easy. You're a program director, which means you and or your music director at your station choose what gets played. Now, what business are you in? You're not in the business of music, per se. You're in the advertising business. That's right. how you make your money at your station. Yeah. Which means you're playing to your fans and you need ratings. So you have your audience and you play the music they like. And there's, on the billboard, there's Hot 100, but most stations have the top 40. Right. Which means there's 40 slots each week of songs that are being played. Out of those 40 slots... So wait, is, is that the only songs they're playing? Like, yeah. Like, like, when you like go modern to, music today, like when modern you go radio listen stations. To, yeah, go, go look at the blogs, uh, the, the logs for any of your major pop stations. They're playing the same songs over and over in rotation, right? Rick D's. Yeah. <laughs> and the weekly top so 40. The, there's 40 slots. In addition to those 40 slots, they might throw some extras in, maybe five songs, 10 songs. Right. To see how they do. But as far as the chart goes, with things climbing and things falling, maybe two to three slots open up on that chart a week. And at the most, you'll probably see a station add, officially add to the playlist four or five songs a week. Now, as a program director, you're getting in songs every day in the mail, and at least you used to. Now they're coming in email. Right. Um, and let's say you now have 40 songs in your inbox that you need to listen to to see if they're worthy of going on your station. Picking up those three or four spots. Correct. Now, let's say you hear a great song that's killer. It's going to change the world. But nobody from the label calls you. No one's talked to you about this song. It's just sitting in your inbox. You don't have the time to reach out to that person and go, this is an amazing record. What's going on? Which is what most people think is going to happen. You send right. an amazing record. They're getting phone calls on Tuesday and Wednesday from all these promo people talking up the records that they want them to add. No one's talking about this other record that they heard one time that they thought was really amazing. Are you going to give up valuable real estate on your playlist for a song that has no plan behind it, no promotion and no money? Why should I add this record? Oh, because they're going to be on the Tonight Show this week. Oh, okay. What else are they doing? Oh, they're on a national tour opening up for so-and-so. Oh, okay, yeah, well, then my fans are going to know about this record. Or, oh, they've got uh, 100, 100 million views on YouTube with no, you know, no radio play. Right. Oh, well, then fans are going to be drawn to my station who normally would not be there because they've only heard it on YouTube. If you've got songs in the mix that are sent in from somebody who spent their life savings and maxed out their credit cards to do one song and there's no game plan, it's probably not going to get added. Now, let's go to the next state. Step. The guy is a saint, the program director, and decides to play it anyway. And the phones start to light up, and it's a Christmas miracle. Um, and it looks like stardom is a few steps away. Well, unless that song starts to spread to other stations, there's only one station in the country playing it. And normally, if you're going to chart, you're going to see more stations pick it up and it's going to spread. But other stations are going to do the same uh, vetting same criteria. Process. Correct. Mm -hmm. They're not getting calls from anybody. And unless you have a, a promotional budget for people to be calling the other stations and letting them know that, hey, guess what? In this one station in Ohio, the shit's blowing the fuck up. Please listen to this record. Put it on. Give it a shot. You want the If you like it, we'll have the artist call you and do it on air with you. Right. It's a great little story about how a small town person became. But without yeah. that going on, there's no story. Nobody knows about shit. I don't care if you have an internet out there or not. It's one station playing it. Wow. So that's why I said the worst thing that can happen is is you, the worst thing that can happen is you have a partial budget 
And you're like, okay, well, I put together $50,000 and I'm going to go make this record happen. Well, that's great, except that if you happen to almost catch fire and you've spent dollar fifty thousand and one, you're going to lose that record in the next two weeks because there's no more money for it. And you're going to be running around town trying to go to a label going, but see, I did this much. And I mean, labels take two, three months just to do damn contracts with you. You, you expect them to jump on board? I think they think they're going to come to them if they yes. hear it on there. And, and sometimes they do, you know. With but, but, but how, like, what fraction of a percent is that out of all the records that do that? It's a very small fraction, which is why a, a, a solid game plan is super important. So, so how much, so, so there's, there's this, there's this big illusion between creatives, especially like musicians, artists, whatever. They never think about that it's a business. Correct. And that was one thing that my dad did teach me from a young age. He said, if you choose to go into this business, remember something, there's more letters in the word business than there are in the word music. And if you want to treat this like a business and make money at it, remember that it is the music business. If you just want to do it for the art and for the love of it, and you don't want to make a dime at it, then write whatever you want, play it for me and your mom and your uncles will tell you you're a good boy and it sounds good. But if you want to make money at it, treat it like a business. And that goes back to the whole point you were talking about, about um, selling out. You know, labels want something that's commercial that they can blow up at radio. A lot of bands don't want to do that. As a producer in the middle of it, my whole thing is, listen, give them the song they need so that they spend their money breaking your band. The other nine songs in the album can be as moody and left to center and not pop as you want them to be. But you got to give them the one. Give them the one. Play the game. If you don't play the game, they have no reason to put the machine behind you. Wow. What's more important? So do you, so it's a combination. Like I was going to ask you, what's, what do you think is more important? So it's not always just the amazing song. It's more of everything else. It's, it's, the game plan. It's, game plan. It's everything. It's an amazing song is great, but you know, right is relative to people. Right. What you think is an amazing song, I might not think right, is an amazing song. And if you're a band and you're like, oh, man, this is the most amazing, incredible work we've ever done. And yet the president of your label likes this other song that you didn't want to record in the first place. But if you don't give him the ability to push the song he wants since he writes the checks, mm -hmm. he might give you enough rope <clears throat> to hang yourself with your song that you think is the greatest thing since sliced bread. And that's the end of it. If you had played the game differently and allowed him to go with what he wanted. If right. he failed, he's going to feel more beholden to give you guys a second shot. Right, but if you right. force the issue and be like, no, this is my life, my career, you're the label president, and we're going to stand our ground and say, we want to go with this. And we go, okay, well, we'll go with that. And, and you're fails, replaceable. You're done. <laughs> right. Kind of like what you were saying before when you had the artist in there that was saying, how, how could these guys come in today and know what I'm trying to get with myself? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Jamie, my, my partner, uh, production partner who's in the group All for One, um, if he was here, he would tell you the story himself of I Swear, which was a John Michael Montgomery country song. Um, really? Yeah. And it was doing very, very well on the country charts. And it was on Atlantic Records, which is what Jamie's band All for One was signed to. Right. And Doug Morris, who was the head of the label, had just had a meeting with Gerald Levert, who turned the song down and said he didn't want to do it. And in came Jamie's group All for One. And Doug played them the song, and he said, I, I really think this this song can cross to pop. We've just signed a, a large producer deal with a gentleman named David Foster, who had just come <laughs> off the Bodyguard soundtrack, and I will always love huge. you. Mm -hmm. um, he's going to produce the record, and we want to get you guys in the studio to record this. And Jamie was like, but that's a country song. We're an R&B group. <laughs> Why would we do that? And, and, and not to mention, they had a song called... Um, so so in, uh, so in love that mm -hmm. was sitting at number two at the time. It was an acapella song. Right. Um, so they're on top of the game and on top of the charts. And Doug's talking about ending the life of that record early so that this record can take over. And Jamie's going, but we're an R&B group and this is a country song. I don't even like country. I don't want to cut this. Right. Um, 
And fortunately, he was able to be convinced by the rest of the group and or the manager or Doug or whoever to go cut a song that he hated because it came the biggest song of his freaking career. Does he hate it now? No. <laughs> no, he's he's learned he, he, over the years. Uh, and just to illustrate, you know, he told me about um, when they were out touring, he felt like they were doing too many white shows. That he wasn't get, seeing too many white shows. Yeah, too many white audiences. Like he wanted to do a show that was an urban, true urban show. If there's two black guys in the group, why can't we be doing shows for black folks? Yeah, and I understand it. So he went to the promotion staff and he said, "We want to do more urban." oriented shows we're not just this white pop group right um so atlantic put him on with um i think little kim um i'm trying to remember i think it was little kim uh Seems and like and a... and um the headliner was mary j blige and they put her put these guys on after mary j um so mary j finishes her set and she's carried off by these dudes you know like a, an egyptian queen yeah and on come these four guys singing, I swear. <laughs> and all of a sudden you hear people going, boo, and, oh and pelting God. them and throwing shit at them. Oh, and, my God. And Jamie said he, like, dropped the mic and left the stage, got in the limo, and well, he looked at the promotions person and he said, you know what, from now on, put me with people who want to see me and that's who I'm going to perform <laughs> for. They did so awesome on the uh, I Love the 90s And, and the point of that being tour. that, you know, white, black, whatever, if you have a, if you find an audience. Yeah. Stick with it. That's amazing. It's yeah. amazing to find an audience, period. You yeah, know, 90s. it doesn't, you don't need validation. Oh, well. So how did, so how did you meet Jamie? I met Jamie when we were doing the Love Shouldn't Hurt project. The All for One was on on the project as well, and um, it, we did that for it was for Quincy Jones for his label, and See we became guy? Quincy was great. Okay, we became friends, uh, Jamie and I, and he wanted to learn. Well, he was writing because he'd written a lot of the songs on the albums, but he wanted to do it like Kipner and I were doing it. Like he really wanted to do it not just for his group. Right. So he bugged us and he was like, listen, I'll sing free demos for you, whatever, just, I, I just want to be in the room with you. But meanwhile, you he's got a hit song and he's saying this. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, 93, was, 93, 94 was I Swear and then I Can Love You Like That was after that. I think his group might have either just left their label in 98 or was getting ready to, something like that. But he was looking towards future. So he sang a few demos for us. Um... And I think we wrote one song together, and then... I mean, the dude's got fucking range. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then I got asked in 2000 to do a song for Stuart Little, uh, too. Yeah. Okay. And I had 30 hours to do it. And when I say 30 hours, unlike O-Town, I had 30 hours to go from like the no song starts. existing to 30 hours later, I needed to be in mastering with the final A day mix. and a half. Yeah. Wow. So I called Jamie up and his partner Jason, and I said, "Listen, we've we seem to work well together. I just said yes to something, but I can't pull this off on my own. I need I need to have more than one room going. Um, do you guys want to do this with me?" And they said yes, and we knocked it out. We ended up staying up all night mixing, and I drove it over to mastering in the morning, and all went well. Um, and that's where we first got the chance to work together on a, an equal, you know, in the, in the, in Under the a highly of, stressful situation. Yeah, and it went great. So we, we started to work together at that point And that's when that was the beginning of the heavyweights. How far, how soon after that, did you guys decide like, Oh, we need to team up? Um, pretty soon. I mean, we, we worked for, that was 2001, I think 2000 to 2001. And then, uh, we did a, Another Jim Brickman song with Wayne Brady in 2004 or 5. We did an All for One album in 2004. Um, we moved into a separate building in 2004 and really started to, you know, get, we got out of everybody. We all had studios in our houses. Right. But as we also all had kids, it was time to get out of the houses so we could work without distractions. Yeah. yeah. The computer keys are sticking together because somebody dropped yeah. ice cream. <laughs> yeah. Whose peanut butter is this? Um, <laughs> it's the dogs. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and uh, we had a, 
tremendous amount of work uh, as the heavyweights all over the world from we were doing things on different Australian Idol winners to Korea but how to, did that but how did that pick up how did that get like because you guys don't because you guys don't like market and promote yourselves to an you? extent we do I mean one thing I would how, do how is, would you do that well because I was signed to EMI as a writer I made sure that I would stay up till one two three in the morning and jump on the phone or email to various territories since EMI had my rights worldwide so I would call EMI Denmark and EMI Germany and EMI London and make connections there and be like listen you know if you don't have my songs um, or if you do have them I'm the guy who's behind them and I want to talk to you so that if if something's not right or something's close for your territory and I don't understand how your territory works, I can understand it and I can give you something that's more customized for you or whatever it is. Um, And we started to get a lot of cuts around the world. And when those affiliates would come to town for meetings with the the corporate office, I would always let them know that I would take them to lunch or whatnot. You know, squeaky wheel gets the grease. Right. Um, So that's how I would would promote and brand within within the realm of EMI so that I was being noticed and at least getting a shot at getting my songs heard. And then it was up to the songs themselves to actually be good enough to actually be worthy of getting placed. So this is up till like what, 2008, nine? This, I mean, this went on till I left EMI in 2015 after 23 years. You know what, what precipitated that or is that? Um, just, EMI had gotten gobbled up by Sony yeah. Um, they became huge, like really huge, um, to the point where I no longer knew anybody and, and hardly any of the divisions. And even though I would meet them, they were turning over every three months or so because they were just still learning how to put these two massive companies together. Um, and I felt like, you know, I had been with one publisher for 22, 23 years so that it was time to go a different route. And just change some things up. Too. And then and the, and the industry was changing as well. I mean, the earnings were different. Um, we had the pl- 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 proliferation of streaming taking over. Um, and a lot of people who historically were making $200,000 on a Christmas song uh, might watch their income drop to 10% of that because streaming wasn't paying what uh, sales were. And Yeah, the number is terrible. Yeah. And uh, like I, we fractions can, of a penny. Right? It is, and it, it is. It's it's actually, it's about a thousandth of a penny. You need a thousand people to stream your song, if you've written it by yourself to earn one penny. Wow, that. Whereas, to put in a comparative uh, illustration, when you would buy a download or a physical CD, that song would generate nine cents mm-hmm. um, for every copy. If you wrote it by yourself, how is that? How is, is that, that with like Apple? Or Seriously, iTunes? how well, is it? This is before. This is before. I think we're talking about before, like the the pe- like the the growth of Spotify or the. Or well, the I just growth I can personally speak. Remember, I just got my check after an album from six years ago. What'd you get? Sixty four dollars for what? Uh, ten songs. Yeah. And, but I don't know on, what, on what on what service. I don't, it's like uh, $10, ten ten dollars a year. But I know, like I know for a fact, there's more than even six or seven people that bought the full album. I have it. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it's just that was an eye opener to me. I like, mean, I, was, I don't have any expectation what, with it, but it was just very. What, I mean, I mean, what was that? I mean, what was that for the music community? Oh, That's well, insane. we're still. But it, but it was in like ninety no two thousand like two or something was Napster. Yeah, yeah. Napster. Napster was. Um, I mean, did the industry's like collective assholes just shut and go like? What no, you know what happened. On? Nobody paid attention to iTunes when iTunes. And when I say nobody, I'm talking about the music industry. Right. They didn't think it was going to become what it was. They didn't see it. Um, Napster, they were able to shut down, basically. And when it came time for Spotify and Pandora and all these other things, they tried to make up for their mistake with iTunes by getting shareholder stake in these companies. But what they did was they took the lion's share of the royalty that was being offered and ended up fucking the songwriter in the process. Because right well, now... they're still getting rich. Right now, the, the label makes about 11 times what a songwriter makes. Wow. And historically, if you were to license a movie, uh, a song so to a movie... For plays, they get... Right. Money. It's still insane. That's yeah. still insane. So, you know, there's been antiquated laws... Um, the last time the copyright law was addressed or looked at was 98. That was three years before the invention of the iPod. That should tell you something 
They're alone. What was that documentary we saw? It was at 30 Seconds to Mars. And even in digital downloads, they still um, have damage fees. You don't like to make yeah. it for damage. Like you're yeah. not selling a physical yeah, even, copy. Even, but yeah. Remember, but they, remember that? Was it the 30 Seconds to Mars? It, yeah, was but it? I forget the name of it, what, what it was. It was a great documentary about the music business. Yeah. yeah. Because they basically got shelved, but they went out on a limb on their own and made this record. Right? But That's they what were, they were trying but they to were, do. But they were, they were saying that, um, you know, they got the upfront money to make the album. They're selling out arenas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know their album. Remember at the end they break they break then, down all the yeah, money like at the end, and then at the end they're like, and we still owe two hundred thousand yeah. dollars back to the record company. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> that that but the, I mean that that's, seems that's the yeah. TLC. Like how do you even like make well, <clears throat> listening to podcasts, other people's podcasts about music? It seems like right now they're saying that the new record labels are um, basically concert promoters, right? Because a majority of an artist's money comes from live performances rather than the well, record itself, right? It's always it always has. Um, but don't they have even, to pay to perform was, now? Who? Like artists to go on tour? Yes and no. I'll, I'll, I can explain that too. When 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 my dad had taught me about the industry, he would explain that when singles were popular in the fifties, nobody really made money off records. You would. It was a device to let people know you were coming to town. If you heard right. a record on the radio, you would keep an eye out for Elvis showing up. Right. Um, and most people made money off of touring and performances that's where the money was it wasn't until like the late 70s early 80s where real money was starting to come in for records because prices had jumped and and it was a booming industry right um now we're at a point where since sales have now slowed if not diminished entirely because since streaming starting to take over right um labels changed their strategy and years ago labels never got any percentage of your touring that was purely on you. Are these like the 360 deals? Correct. There's a term called a 360 deal, yeah. which basically means it's all encompassing. So if you But if they do an ad for Lowe's, right. If you they do get the it, money. Right. If you if you're Natasha Bedingfield and you're signed to a label and you become the face of the gap. The label's going to get a piece of that because as far as they're concerned, you would have never had the opportunity to be the face of the gap had they not invested their money in you to try to blow up your album. That's that seems crazy to me. And it's industry accepted at this point. It's industry wide, three sixty deals. It's kind of like are they the, own you. <laughs> they own Every a piece of, of yeah. all of your revenue. merchandising and revenue. To their feelings, if we're going to put promotional dollars behind you, whether we make it back on that album or not, we're going to make it back over here. If if you blow wow. up. Well, I mean, they want them. They want. They're looking at you as an investment. Yeah. And you're going to return on them in some way or another, and they're increasing their odds of you returning for them if they're going to be getting a piece of all the pies. So I mean, do, I mean, do you do you think? I mean, what's what's your thought? I mean, <clears throat> especially with with that you have. Uh, um, oh, what are those companies? That you that you're with BMI. Oh, ASCAP, EMI. 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 Oh. EMI. The publishing companies, right? Like, yeah. So so you, like. I mean, are the, do those things even matter anymore? Because publishing companies? Yeah, because I mean, oh, are, totally. Because are they take are, are they the ones taking the money or publishing? The one area, even we're finally at a point where the music industry is up as a whole this year. I think the, we crested over seven million dollars, which is the first time since like ninety seven or ninety eight billion or seven yeah, million billion. Okay. Um, publishing companies have never first time since nineteen ninety eight. Yeah. In twenty years. Yeah. So it's been on a decline that whole time. Yeah, when That's I mean, insane. I think in '98 we were, we were, um, might have been like 22 billion. Like it was much bigger than where we are now. The file sharing is what started to decline. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's around that time. But that doesn't mean the artist is getting that amount of money. No, no, no. The, well, like it, like that the amount of money an artist would get in 1998. Oh, per 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 units compared to today. Same, well, almost the same amount of money. Per unit, the problem is the number of units being sold has diminished in twenty years. So where's the where's the revenue coming from to equate? performance, right? The concerts from everywhere else. Publishing, there's more avenue. Publishing has never s- stopped its growth. Right. Why? Because you have people licensing commercials for Nesty Internet only in France commercials that are geocached for six months. Um, the uh, or geofenced, I should say, not geocache. Sorry. Yeah. Um. You know, just for a territory. Sure. There's more avenues 
to utilize music. There's Netflix. There's all these things that didn't exist before, and they all need music. So publishing is continually grown. The way music's being consumed is completely different in that it's now being it's, we're moving towards full blown streaming. Um, and Goldman Sachs came out with a, a projection finally when they talked about the fact that this was the first up year that within five years they project the music industry to crest above a hundred billion because of saturation of streaming. Because right now, you know, right now we all have phones that don't. I guess a lot of us now finally have unlimited plans, even though they they stop at about twenty gigs a month. Right, right. Once we truly have unlimited uh, data, you're going to see people streaming Pandora in cars constantly and consuming consuming it the, the way they want to without worrying about but, caps. But, is, but does that projection now benefit the artist more? It does. Um, for a couple of reasons, obviously, the the more saturated you get with the country, the more revenue that's going to come in for streaming. Um, you know, it, when when you're transitioning, this is coming up and this one's going down. So, depending on how they how fast one rises versus one falling, can really affect your income a lot. Once everybody's consuming it the same way, income's going to increase. There's also a, a lot of things going on behind the scenes in Washington that I've been fortunate enough to be a part of. Yeah, I want to talk about that. Uh, something called the Music Modernization Act, which is designed to help lift some of these pre-98 and, and actually going back to 1940, some of these uh, laws that have really handcuffed um, songwriters and artists too. But a songwriter's income is 75% regulated by the government. 75% of all the money we make is under government regulation of how we make it and how we can negotiate for it. Now explain that to me, because okay, well, that's stupid. There's something called a consent decree, and a consent decree is something that the Department of Justice whips out when they feel that there's a monopoly taking place. So let's say you're Exxon Oil, yeah. and you're huge, yeah. and Joe Blow's oil down the street doesn't have a prayer in hell because Exxon's the monopoly. Right. So the government might step in and say, okay, tell you what, Exxon, we have two choices for you. One, we can take you to court and break apart your company because you're too big. Or you can agree to sign this paper with us, and this paper will lay out certain actions you need to take and business practices so that it's fair for everybody, right. so that the little guy has a chance to. So in 1940, when ASCAP and BMI started, um, inherently they are monopolies. There's only two of them at that point. So the Justice Department s stepped in and said, listen, you need to um, sign these consent decrees. And it's going to make it fair for all the radio stations that want to license your works. Well, that was great for 1940, but fast forward to today. I'll show you it how... Phonographs and shit. Yeah, but yeah. still, I'm, I'm going to show you how these outdated laws can cause the problems that are being caused. You and I decide we're going to start a streaming service to, today. We're going to do High Five, we're starting a streaming service. Right. How do we do that? We have to write a letter to ASCAP and to BMI and ask for a blanket license for all of their work so that we can play them. Now, under the law and under the consent decrees, um, the they can't say no to us. And under the law, we are allowed to start using the work today. We can start broadcasting while the letter's in the mail. Okay? Okay. We don't have to pay for anything retroactively until we get a quote and even when we get the quote we don't have to pay retroactively we pay from the point forward but since I'm savvy and I know the law I know what happens in disputes like if, if you and I get a note back from ASCAP saying this is how much money we want to license all our works and we don't like that number well then you go to rate court well, there's only two rate courts in the country with two judges one for ASCAP and one for BMI and because there's only two of them and they're appointed for life they're backed up with disputes for about two years. So Holy I know shit. that you and I can start our company today. You dispute it, and then if, then you're in limbo. Right? right, so I'm going to put at the end of our letter, oh, by the way, ask at PS, don't really bother sending us a quote at all, because whatever you send me, I'm not going to like. I'd rather go to rate court and fight it out there. So now you and I are broadcasting our streaming services, selling advertising, making money, and if we choose to go bankrupt before we get to court, we get to keep all the money that we earned anyway. Or we can go to court and actually get our low rate 
um, and continue to stay in business, uh, but we don't have to pay for the two years of use that uh, so got us. So the revenue it. you generated right there is, is... 100% yours. You're wow. not paying the creator at all. Not paying the artist, not paying anybody. Holy shit, you literally don't have <laughs> to pay... Not That's insane. Stones, you don't have to do that. You have to pay the... You'd, you'd have to come to terms with the label because the label, who owns the master isn't under any kind of government regulation. They are allowed to negotiate in a free market for fair market value. We can't negotiate in a, f- in a free market. We have rate court judges that do it for us. And here's the other fucked up part. I just told you earlier that the labels are getting 11 times what we're getting right. as a rate. So the first thing you would think we should do is if we're going into battle our company, uh, you know, the songwriters are going to battle our company. They're going to say to the judge, Your Honor, the rate that they're asking you to lower is already 11 times less than what the labels are getting. Right. And the judge is going to say, you know what? I'm aware of that. Unfortunately, because of the way the law is written, I'm not allowed to use that in my ruling. So some of the things in the Music Modernization Act do things like we're going to start rotating judges. We're going to have more courts available. And the courts are now going to be able to look at cost of living, what others okay. are earning, so that it can be more par- more parity in the actual rates. Well, because it just seems like across the board, there's one equation, and that's what you get. Well, it, it's funny. I was thinking about this the other day. I, I looked up the history of royalties. Now, when royalties first started in, like, 1909, um, most of it was for player piano roles that you would buy for your piano Right. Or Is phone. That like the, do, 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 yeah. Do, yeah. And from 1909 until 1980? What? 1909. So years? Yeah. Uh, the, the royalty was at two cents, is what you would earn per copy. Wow. Okay. Through the wait, depression wait, wait, wait. and everything. <laughs> it went up to, I think, 5.5 or six cents, maybe seven. Okay. Yeah. I, I, Somebody Google out there, you'll find it, um, in like 1980. Then it went up again in the 95 to 9 cents, which is what I said to you earlier. Right. Now, let's look at that. If I took the cost of eggs or milk or butter and I compared what it cost in 1909 versus what they cost today, I guarantee you it would be a greater jump than 2 cents to 9 cents. Well, gas has done that recently. Like since I was in high school, gas has done that. that used to be you guys a cup are of just coffee. Gas used screwed. Eight percent or something. It was below a dollar. Or ninety-eight That's cents. That's terrible. It was 90, Ninety-one cents when I was in mm-hmm. high school. Mm-hmm. And now so it's up to two ninety. Even if we even we go by hundred percentages, so two cents, four cents would be a hundred percent increase. Six would be a two hundred percent increase. Eight would be a three hundred percent increase. If we got up to ten, we we're at a four hundred percent increase. Go look up the cost of basic goods between 1909 and 2018, and I guarantee you, you're going to see more than a 400% increase. Like 2,000 or 3,000. So, <clears throat> in general, like if all this passes, does that mean like streaming services are going to be more expensive then because they're going to have to pay more to operate or? Maybe. More ads on Pandora or? Exactly. You know I mean? Well, that's okay. the thing we've been saying is that, you know, don't come and bitch at us that you don't have enough money to pay people fairly for their work. That to me sounds like a, um, a bad business model. You know, you either need to charge more for your ads, um, but you can't just base a business model on, well, we're, we have this much to give out and we're sorry, the labels got here first, so they get more than you. I mean, you've been working on this for years, though. A couple of years. A couple of years. And we just had the Copyright Board, separate from this legislation, gave us a 40% increase in streaming rates in January. So wait, down in D.C. they did this? Yeah. Now wait, so when you say we gave us, right? Us, the writers and publishers. But but how many people are involved in this down there? Uh, Well, I mean, it affects everybody that's a songwriter. No, no, no. How many people are involved in, like, lobbying or, or trying to get it? Back to a few hundred, just at least being fair. A few hundred. So you're going out there representing uh, every every songwriter, songwriter across, across the country. Yeah, 
Yeah, that Sona, Sona is Songwriters in North America, which is a, a organization that I helped start. Um, there's also the you helped National, start Sona. I did. I wasn't I wasn't one of the founding members, but I was pretty early on. There was like eight people involved, and then somebody came and asked me some questions and asked me if I wanted to be involved, and I've been on board ever since. Um, then there's the National Association of Songwriters, um, which is based out of Nashville, NSAI. Um, and they have thousands of members and represent uh, songwriters all over the world. But as far as people going to bat to get to fair, how, how many are you? A few hundred. I mean, there's a core group, I'd say, of probably less than 100 that are actually out there foot soldiering the hill and talking to Congress people and trying to get things done. Um, but collectively, I'd say there's hundreds of people that travel to and from Washington. Is, is it hard for people? For, for politicians to wrap their head around this? Not really. It, it just just like you sat here with your mouth dropped at, you know, the two cents to nine cents maneuver or in the fact that we could start, you know, I told the same story to senators about let's start up a, 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 a Zamdora. That's, that's going to be a company, Zamdora. Yeah. And they're stunned that somebody can use someone's work for two years' time without owing them anything, you know? Our whole thing is I'm not I'm not I'm not coming to you like the IBM typewriter salesman saying I can't sell typewriters anymore because technology changed. Right. Our industry is actually making more money than it's ever made right now. And we're on the upswing. We're just not getting our fair piece of it. There's a difference. You know, it'd be one thing if I was saying, well, I'm, we're not selling records anymore. OK, so go get another job. But we are selling records, so to speak. We're just selling them via streams. That's so crazy. Could you imagine if like people like uh, beyond our control were taking money for our work and then just like handing us a, a dime? You it's know what I mean? Taxes. I mean, okay, there's taxes, but <laughs> yeah, still, now we're taxed on that dime. <laughs> but still, it's like there, well, it I, seems like there's so many people taken from everywhere, and then oh, this one's getting eleven if, if, times any, more. Any, anybody that's ever listened to Pandora, you get what five songs, and then you get an ad if mm -hmm. you're on the freebie, yeah. right? Right. Yeah. Okay, so I already now told it's like you double ads too. Yeah. Okay, so I already told you how much those five songs they're paying out. They're paying out five one thousandth of a penny per person for those five songs. Right. Right. But they're doing double ads. How much did they charge for those ads? Any oh my idea? gosh. Like, no, I don't, because they're doubling the revenue right now. Let's put it this way. At a minimum, they're probably pulling in 40 cents per ad. So wouldn't you like to be in a business where you, you make 80 cents and your cost on the music side of things is five one thousand? That's crazy. I, I can't even... Five one thousand. Like, like, I didn't think like, about it in like that perspective before. That's like <laughs> that's like comparing, you know, what what Apple has to what I make. Yeah. Like their revenue Correct. versus right. my income, and it's just like an insult to the music people, be, or yeah. the artists, because it's like they're the. Thanks you're, for creating. Well, we, this you're thing. giving them the the gas for the. We had a, we had a talk with Spotify. Um, a friend of mine did. They were in a meeting with them, and they decided to ask them a very simple question. They said, "What." Do you believe is Spotify's product? Now, I'll ask you guys, what is Spotify's product? Why would you go to Spotify? What do you think? Music. Okay, that's two. I, I, I don't, they don't have a product. Okay, but what, what do you consume there? Music. Okay, there's three of you. Okay. Spotify didn't say that. Spotify said their product was Spotify. Hmm. What the fuck does that mean? Exactly. My product is Jay Z. And the person said, Are you kidding me? People come to Spotify to consume music. Our music. Right. You're making money off of our creative works. And they're like, no, people come to Spotify for the Spotify experience, which part of that the includes. The Spotify, right. Spotify. So if you ask them, okay, take away all the music now. Right. What are you? Yeah, what yeah. are you? What, what, what do you have left? What was the ratio of, um, website I think, and an app. was it Kay who wrote at the Huffington Post an an uh, for like the millions of views? I think it was, I forget what it was, Little Mix or something. Oh, that was, uh, that was uh, Michelle. Michelle yeah. Lewis, who started Sona. She wrote for the Huffington Post, and I, I... She wrote about her earnings for a little mix, and I don't remember the exact numbers, but I can give you... Frankenstein. I remember Frankenstein writing. Wasn't there like 12 people on it? Something like that. Too. But, I mean, if you just look at Pharrell, I'm sure everyone heard about either Pharrell with Happy or um, All About That Bass. You know, All About That Bass did something stupid like 
50 million or 70 million streams back then. Um, and the writer got a check for $5,000. I remember reading an article song. about that. I, yeah. I forget the writer was like, how can I, like, if right. this is my career, how can I support a family? And I Correct. That's mm-hmm. so, so well, that's, that's what I was saying, like, in, in using the illustration of um, a thousandth of a penny. It, so for a billion views on YouTube, which... Justin Bieber or someone of that caliber mm-hmm. would be at. That's about the pinnacle. Um, that roughly earns you for 100% of the song before publishing splits or taxes about $30,000. Now, oh you gosh. don't write a Justin... I don't care how good you are. You don't write a Justin Bieber-sized number one hit every day. If you if you did, Justin Bieber's songs would all be written by the same person. Right. And they're not. Right. You know? Even Max Martin, who's got a better batting average than most... Um, you think writes for like Katy Perry? Yeah, yeah, do- yeah. Uh, Max Martin and Doctor Luke, right? Don't yeah, they, they're like the right major. Now, a couple writer. I know for a fact uh, a couple of years ago that um, Max had shared his digital income, which was just streaming, and for all of his hits, and they go way back. Um, I mean, he's had like twenty-two number one hits at or least. Something. Yeah. yeah, he was earning less than a hundred thousand dollars a year from digital streaming. For all of his hits, he might as well go work at. at I know. Two so that's what I'm saying. If you, you're if, getting robbed. If, if you're fortunate enough to write two songs for Bieber or one for Bieber and Selena Gomez, um, and you've written them with one other person, so now you've each made fifteen thousand dollars a piece before thirty thousand total each of you before taxes and before anybody collects on publishing. Uh, how many people? Can afford to raise someone in Pennsylvania, let alone Los Angeles and New York, for that. I can't even fathom. Like, a, like just a, just a child. Yeah. Right. So if that's the pinnacle, what happens to the kid who's starting out? What happens to me when I get a Hey Santa in this day and age? Um, and it is a mild hit, and I earn four thousand dollars because of that. That's all it's going to earn. How? What am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to drive Uber? Am I supposed to? That's insane because it's like in every. So we're trying to really play. ensure well, we, that we, we, that there'll be future writers be able to to afford to choose this as a career. So in the long run, it's like the engineer makes more than the artist in a sense. In, in a lot of senses, yeah. I can't even like That's fathom crazy. a thousandth of a penny. Like, <laughs> it's insane. I. I, I know. It just, it just it just it just boggles my mind. I mean I mean did you did you see like the tide shift to an extent? Oh yeah, absolutely. And then you were like. Absolutely. I mean, did something. you go like we're fucked, or like thank God we have a recording studio? Um, I can tell you personally, I I was wise enough to set up some um, retirement funds early on when I was making money. Right. Um, I can tell you personally, I definitely had to dip into some of them over the past four years, um, to just to balance out some of the shifts. But we're starting to see things shift back the other way, so hopefully, I can keep the rest of my retirement fund. Hopefully. But that's good that you're going and with all these other people and like trying to change it actively. We are. We're, you know, effectively having Trump in office isn't a bad thing for us, actually, because the Republican agenda as a rule of thumb is very favorable to small business owners. And that's effectively what a songwriter or anybody in the music industry is. You're a small business owner because... I mean, um, most of them are like LLC'd or... But even if you're not, if you're just a a dude, the, the way... Our income is derived. Um, we we can't unionize because we are independent contractors. And there was some test of the law because of um, free agents with baseball who wanted health insurance. They wanted to be able to unionize and get health insurance. And the judge said no because you're effectively an independent oh, contractor. Exactly. <laughs> you have no and like every aspect of your industry. It's like no, no, oh, no. Oh, it's insane. No. Yeah, but going back to your $30,000 that you and your partner songwriter made, you get $15,000, right? Well, let's let's Is let's, that for let's, a billion let's, runs? Yeah, let's let's bring oh. it let's bring it back into reality. Um you know, in today's day and age, if if you have a mild hit you may, maybe you'll see a hundred million views. Maybe, maybe. So now you're talking about not thirty thousand. You're talking about three thousand, because a, a billion to a hundred million divided right. by ten. So now we got three thousand dollars for fifteen hundred. Fifteen hundred, and then if you have a publisher collecting, they're taking their share too. Dude, and then you what have the taxes. fuck does that leave you with? <laughs> Not much. A kettle. So, so wait, now you're down to what? <laughs> let, let, let's just say for, for I, arguments. I got a check in. G. You want to talk about Hey Santa? I got a check in. For, I think it was um, 
I believe it was Pandora, and there were 10 million streams. And I'm like, damn, that means 10 million motherfuckers enjoyed my shit. Yeah. And the check was like fifty dollars. Fifty dollars. Oh my god! I mean, it's almost it's almost like. Yeah, and Jimmy, you want to take that? <laughs> yeah, you bastard. <laughs> <laughs> you no, of I'm a penny. I'm just making people say, oh, wow, yeah, let me go listen to the real version now. And then you get well, a hit, right? A thousandth of a penny. <laughs> I mean, That's insane. I mean, I, mean, I mean, do you see, do you see like the pendulum sw- swinging back? A l- I don't know if it's ever going to be what it was, but do you see the pendulum swinging back at least a little bit? Um, Cause no, I, I do. Cause, it is, cause it is going to swing back a, a lot because... As these judges are allowed to now make decisions based upon fair market value, the parity is going to go up. So that's going to help. And then, as I said, part of the rates that were already set in January for the next six years, um, over the next six years, basically increased by about 40% of what they're at now. But still, if you take a thousandth of a penny and go to 40% of what they, you know, it's getting better. It still sucks. But we're getting there. So it's this is why it's really important. Wait, wait, to, the thousandth of a penny is only getting increased by forty percent, though. It's a forty percent. Yeah, it's forty percent increase. Which so is like, really a lot. It's like a half yeah. of a penny almost. Then. Right. So are you guys? Which is better. The, yeah. The groups that you guys are doing this is this like the first that have come together? Or are these have yes. you guys been actively problem, trying to fight it? There's been lots of people bitching and moaning about ways to do this. The problem is music. The industry historically is splintered. Producers have their agenda and their desires. Publishers have their agenda and their desires. Writers don't trust publishers. Nobody trusts labels. So when we go to Washington, we walk in like assholes in these tiny little splintered groups going, we want this to make our business better. And Google walks in arm in arm with the NAB, National Association of Broadcasters, controls radio. And they're all very locked arm in arm happy saying, things should be free. This is about keeping costs down for broadcasters, and, and yeah. But do they not realize that, like, if you keep doing this, there are no more artists? But they were able to do it for so long. So we got we we took the advice of a lot of the people that we were sitting in front of, who said, "Listen, I can't see another music industry group that has their own agenda. Can't you guys get on the same fucking page?" So we did. We finally so all these were splinter to, groups. We finally were able to get the publishers and the producers and the writers and the label and everybody on the same page to try to save the ship. I mean, that's like getting Pakistan and Israel and North Korea. When aliens invade. <laughs> Pretty much. And even on this, the Music Modernization Act, we actually got the NAB, who never says yes to anything, to say that they were favorably neutral on this legislation. They, they started out being negatively neutral on the legislation but then we carved them out we we hit an agreement with them where it won't affect uh terrestrial radio for the for the time being so but they, you guys have heavy hitters that are like going and speaking and stuff oh, like all well, of them have like major hits and and multiples yeah, well, and, and i mean it's, just, it's affecting everybody and, yeah. and taylor swift didn't she boycott her music from itunes or something for a little while well mm-hmm. this i can I, and dr okay. dr dre though no it's, but it's just going to say like these bigger time musicians and but you have to you have to take it and making it, a stand you have to understand how which Taylor Swift boycotted? Because I've had relatives call me up and be like, well, why don't you just do what Taylor Swift did and not let them play your stuff? And I'm like, because I can't. It's yeah. against the law for me to say no. And it's also against the law for Taylor Swift to say no. Taylor Swift, the writer, is bound by the same shit that Jack Hugo, the writer, is bound by. Taylor Swift, the artist, can go to her daddy who owns her label and say, Daddy, don't give Spotify my music. But the writer is subject to the same crap that we're all saying. So when you hear Taylor Swift said, they can't play my music, Taylor Swift's label did her a favor and said, we're not going to license your her music to you because they have the right to do so. But it's her dad. But sure. it's still Taylor Swift. I mean... It's still Taylor Swift like, using her clout. It would take yeah. you to go but, to But you just have to understand label. it. Exactly. You'd have to go to your record label and or if Aerosmith went to their label and said... Don't license our shit. And, and they'd probably would and laugh, laugh at you, at you right. probably. Yeah, they're like, we want to do Looks Like the Lady Money. Yeah, we want that 10 million <laughs> plays next year for Christmas for Hey Santa. So because like, we're getting 11 times more than you, than you are. are. Yeah. Correct. So we're on your times, team, but it's 11 because you're taking all your so profits. So that 30,000 um, at a billion would work out to uh, 400,000 per billion for the label. Now, wow. 
that doesn't that that's that's not the equivalent. It's still not a lot for them. It's still though. not no. It's not a lot for them, and it's still not the equivalent of what an old uh, what a hit mine generate during the heyday. But we're not going back to the heyday. We're go, going to look forward. It's still a hell of a lot better than what it is right now. Can 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 somebody li- who makes that hit live on four hundred thousand dollars? I would hope so. Do you think that? Do you think that no one knew how to regulate or legislate the streaming services? Yeah. Well, there's a couple things. There was there like, is it, like, like, there is no to, regulation for them yet. It, yeah, for it's all like, old laws. And if you I mean, and I they, are a streaming company. I can't get mad at a streaming company. I can't on a moral basis, but I can't get mad at them on a business basis for taking advantage of every law that's out there for them. Right. If you and I had a business, we'd do the same shit. But so it, my point was is that is that it's what was it, the Digital Copyright Act, whatever? Mm-hmm. Like they didn't know mm-hmm. what the hell they were getting into. When they did the, the last revision, which was the DCMA, the Digital Copyright uh Millennium Act? Yeah. Um they they did the best they could, not knowing where the road was going. Right. But again, as I said, the last changes that were done were done in '98. That's a long Still time to ago. This day. Yeah. Yeah. You said two years before the iPod. Three years before the invention <laughs> of the iPod. Three years before the iPod. But nobody. But, but like, <sighs> like to me, it would seem like there would be a, a major art artist uproar when this started happening. There was and there wasn't because well, here's the first thing. It, because I think of a streaming service as a radio station, and you're basically going like, the radio stations across the country just played my shit 40 million times, which is a For $2. Lot. <laughs> artists also have a there's, – there's a distinction between the artist and the writer. Artists aren't complaining as much for a couple of reasons. One, artists tour. Artists have merchandise. Artists have other avenues of income, revenue, that songwriters don't. But most, uh, how many of them have through those 360 deals, though? Even with the 360 deal, there's still other avenues of, and like sound exchange. There's a sound exchange royalty that is divided up for the for not terrestrial radio, but for digital services. The artist gets 45 percent of that income. The label gets 50 percent by law, and five percent goes to musicians, etc. That's stupid. Um, that money is decent. It's actually starting to. If you have a hit, it's can be very, very good income. Um, songwriters don't have that income. Um, someone assumes if you wrote a hit for Justin Bieber, you're driving around in a, in a Ferrari like Justin Bieber is. No, you probably have a like a like a Fiat. But without you, Justin Bieber wouldn't have his Ferrari. So, can, like, can I ask you, like, a, for instance, let's say somebody goes, um, you know, let's say l- let's say you're the Foo Fighters, right? And you know, Steven Spielberg's making a movie and says, "I want the Foo Fighters song." Um, and Foo Fighter, and it's not one of their hits. It's just like, like just a really good song, and you know, and, and they go, you know, we want to use this for the film, and you know, Foo Fighters in return, they're they're business people, and the Foo Fighters, I'm sure themselves, I'm sure Dave Grohl is really involved in it. You know, he goes, all right, for two hundred, you give us two hundred fifty thousand dollars, you can license our song, um, which is what I think he did in the last album. They license, you can't own my music, you can license it, mm-hmm. but so then they go, okay, well, we want to put your song on the soundtrack. Okay, great. They put it on the soundtrack. The soundtrack gets only a million views. They got more just from the agreement to say the. Use. Oh yeah, yeah. No, well, first of all, the, when it comes to to movies and TV, that's that's the level playing field for, between um, labels and songwriters and artists. Um, so I mean, are there are a lot of artists chomping at the bit to be like, "Oh God, please get me on like." Oh, every, is commercials blues. the there's same? O- there's always been. It's always been that way. Commercials are the same as well. Licensing. When when you're selling an album, um, you're getting a, a – as an artist, you're getting a royalty, maybe 13%, 14%. And then, you know, so while you're earning 70 cents an album, if that, the label would be earning $6 or $7 an album. Um, Is that for like a nine ninety nine album? Yeah. Yeah. But uh, when it comes to licensing – um, nobody's hands are tied when it comes to licensing for film and television um, and commercials. If two hundred fifty thousand dollars is the license that is agreed to by the label, there's going to be two hundred fifty thousand dollars on the publisher writer side. So, two fifty for the label goes to the label, and then whatever percentage the artist is supposed to get based on their agreement. Two fifty on the publisher writer side, fifty 
a percent of that would go to the publisher, 50 percent would go to the writer, um, depending upon their deal. My deal with EMI was such that I gave up half of my publishing. So effectively out of 250, if we had such a, a license, 25 percent uh, would go to EMI and 75 percent of that would come to me. But that was like a better deal. Oh, yeah, it is. Well, but that's we're talking about smart. that no one's no one's bitched about that portion of the of of the income pie because it's that's always been done properly. The income pie that we're bitching about is streaming and the way and really the way that most music is going to be consumed. So now so are you involved with anything down in our 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 federal capital? Oh, absolutely. So what are you doing what are you doing down there for I mean, like I, the time I was there being? I was down there um as I said, talking to senators and Congress people and representatives, um, as the Music Modernization Act was just introduced to the House and it's made it to the floor, so now it's going to get introduced to the Senate. But I was basically just there. We were there playing songs for people. You know, Shelly Pikin came with us and she wrote um, "I'm a Bitch" and she wrote um, for what a, Brooks, right? yeah, and she wrote uh, "What a Girl Wants," um, and she would play on her acoustic guitar. And you know, one thing I, I find true is whether you're a politician a president whoever people love music it's it's important to all of us universal language it mm-hmm. is it's it's the one thing that you know you can hear a song and immediately be transported back to the first time you heard it you might even smell the same smells that you remember smelling it's weird isn't it mm-hmm. yeah it, it 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 attaches it it's itself to your emotions and locks in that that point in time when you heard it mm-hmm. um you know if you've ever watched a a movie, um, or if you've ever been fortunate enough to watch a movie without music, it's 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 a trip because you. I can name a movie without music. Can somebody else here do it? No score whatsoever. No music. No score. Mm-mm. Network. Oh really? Yeah. Sorry about distracting everyone. <laughs> but if you get if you like a lot of times if you, you go on YouTube and pull up a scene of a certain movie and see if there's a version of it with no music, watch how less emotional it is. Oh, it's it's incredible how less emotional it is. Yeah, like I mean, that's there. To, that's there to accentuate. Yeah, and it's also to interesting to sometimes to see what the wrong music can do to a scene. You know? I've seen that too. Yeah. Um, I, I think I think I think film composers today are are, are the modern day Tchaikovskys, of course, and, and Beethovens and Bachs, and that's what I, I mean. Most of the time, that's what I listen to because it's like I don't have to worry about a lyric. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I can just transport myself, and it'll calm me down or fire me up. Or, but when I there was I was watching C-SPAN, which I never do. But with the morning of the vote, I decided at seven a.m. to get up and watch the damn C-SPAN channel. <clears throat> and I watched Representative Doug Collins from Georgia, who was one of the champions of this, um, start talking very emotionally about music and about you know Motown and how Motown songs meant the world to him as a kid and to this day and. There were other representatives uh, in in the um, in the house that started to talk about music and and in that moment I was they talk about the bill before they yeah they vote on it and I was I was kind of stunned to hear you know people that are dealing with uh, Putin and all kinds of other important things pay so much homage and tribute and and get emotional about music and that you know they needed to help ensure that music was going to be a part of of the fabric you know of our country for years to come and music, be treated and be treated fairly especially yeah. the creators especially and, music, and they got it they music actually is understood important to everybody i mean i don't it i don't know like you said it brings back memories it, like movies and all that kind of stuff like i don't think there's one person that isn't affected by music in some way at I least once been, in their I life think, i think there's been musicians since man found consciousness but what else is there that has is has that much of effect on you know the humans all around the world like i love art all across the, around the, even all if they're the world, hiding in caves they're banging on why, something you know really cool thing to see that brings politics and music together the u.s versus john lennon it's really cool because even the people that like are like <clears throat> Super, super, just all about government and wanted to shut down the protests. Like they still love John Lennon's music. And I they, still they like Dee Snyder <laughs> when you know he pulled I mean? out the. I mean that was I mean that was censorship. That that's yeah. what they're trying to do. They're but still, to, it was like people think cause. that they don't know what they're talking about until 
you find out that people in the music business like well, they, it's all based upon they know what they're talking about. Of course, of course. But it's awesome that these guys not only are you know making hits, but they're actually you know they actually know what they're talking about and the laws and how to you know make things well, it's better. It's taken a long time to get here. You it's know? interesting because <laughs> earlier you said that on your career you you saw yourself as maybe being a lawyer and in a way now you're still you're shaping the political side of it. Thank God your mom made you go to three years of college. Yeah, that helped. <laughs> They definitely cool. helped. You should you should take the bar. Can't you take the bar? I could. I've thought about it. I've thought about it. Maybe, yeah. You know. Boy, that'll give you a big hammer. Are you on the side as an entertainment <laughs> lawyer? I think you already got a big hammer, but this will be a Peter Gabriel hammer. You know, when pe- when when streaming, sorry, when a pan, um, Napster first started. It was like Napster and LimeWire and, and Zon. Right. Mm-hmm. And nobody really, like, I remember the music industry internally was trying to promote the idea of you know, downloading is theft. And nobody gave a fuck because they weren't looking at who it was affecting. They assumed that it was these big labels that don't pay artists properly anyway, so that's who we're hurting. I'm Not sorry. realizing that it actually <laughs> went all the way down to the engineer, the songwriter, these, you know, people who, who aren't living multimillionaire lifestyles. I've got two kids. I'd like to be able to send them to college. I'd like to be able to have a house to retire in. Yeah. You know. I don't uh, need a Bentley or a, or a right. house on the beach. I've never owned a Bentley in my life. Right. But like people like me who did, sorry, download Napster and LimeWire, like, I mean, I didn't know. We did it. Nobody, nobody no, knew. Everybody. But the difference but is But nobody this. knew either. Like, because I we think I would have concerned. We didn't like, realize the collateral damage. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when exactly. I talked to you and when someone would talk to you about Napster, no, it, did, it didn't make sense. When... I have not come across any person that I've explained this thousandth of a penny uh, thing to who goes, oh, well, you guys make plenty of money other ways. Like everyone's kind of stops in their tracks at that point and goes, really? That's the kind of money you, you have to figure out how to live on? I, how do you even cut a thousandth well, of a I, penny? I just saw there was this documentary called Who the Fuck Is, and I forget the guy's name. It's on Netflix. He's one of the biggest guys oh, at Live yeah, yeah. Nation. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. does the tours for like Gaga and U2, and, and he's like the tour manager for them. And he said, uh, you know, years ago you would go on tour to promote an album. Mm-hmm. Now you're releasing an album to promote a tour. Correct. Mm-hmm. You know, so like that's, that's why I was totally saying flipped. The concert promoters are now kind of the new record label. Yeah, that's, you, where that, and you're that's where they're making money. their money. You know, but for people who are, you know, I, but people who don't share in that stream, like songwriters, right? You know, are we supposed to say when oh, someone wants to? You're not getting that for correct. That night. Mm-hmm. We're not getting 360 deals. Are we supposed to do that too? We supposed so to when Wilson out? Phillips goes on tour, sings your song, <clears throat> you don't get shit, right? Um, there is a small performance royalty for live performances, but not enough to not enough to change anybody's life by any means. So that's not going to. Is it gonna... more? Is it more than you would get from Spotify? Oh yeah, but. Without because you guys, there ago. is nothing else. You know what I mean? Like, and that's the r- dumb that's the thing, part. That's the thing that I don't understand. It's like, okay, you're stealing from all these motherfuckers. Just well, keep when sweating no and music. making no all of this stuff. No one's and... looking at the fact that, and what we're trying to ensure you is, have is to that survive. Yes, we're trying to ensure the fact that a kid twenty years from now who wants to be a songwriter can actually work their ass off, learn their craft, and potentially making a living at it. Versus the way we were headed was a kid who wants to be a songwriter 20 years from now can work their ass off, learn their craft, have hits, and not make enough to live off of those hits without driving Uber on a side hustle. But then it makes me wonder how many like amazing songs could be and aren't because of that as well. You know, like, that's a shame. What's... How how do you stay like in the zone when you write like is it hard is it like do you got to slug it or does it just come really for the most part easy to you it's for the most part you learn you learn like how like do you have to be like distractionless do you have no to not be... always not always sometimes distraction's really good um i have certain I, i'll freak people out sometimes because i'll be in the middle of something where i'm supposed to be focusing and i'll pick up a magazine and start reading and my process is such where if I can take the the foreground of my brain and put it into reading an article in the background, it's working and doing a separate multitask. Like six seconds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but it's not to say that, like, in essence, opening up that magazine is actually you working. It is. Yeah. It is. It's because I know my process and I know that if I just distract myself a little bit, I can, the back half of my head will take over for what I need it to. And at some point, I'm going to put the magazine down and go, okay, I got this. 
How important? How important is it to just constantly be writing? Oh, that's what I mean. A writer writes. If you're not Practice writing, your craft. How many songs do you think you write a year? Oh God, it varies. Back then, or, or compared to now? You know, back then I was more concerned with quality over quantity, um, and that's not a bad thing to focus on. But you gotta, you gotta, you could write ten quality songs, and due to luck, none of them go. So you've got to constantly be writing to to make sure you have enough product out there. And how is it like working with people like in Japan? I, I didn't you work with the Eminem of Japan or yeah. something like cuz all these people are in totally different languages. I've done Korea, the, Japan, the gobstopper of Japan, Japan, well, China, the Eminem of Japan. We we did South like Af- Eminem. South African Idol. Eminem like I got, I got paid in goats and chickens. <laughs> did you really? <laughs> hey, can I tell you about goat cheese? <laughs> oh my god, I, I bought it for him. <laughs> and and he I, just, I did the bear wave. I was like, "This is so good." I'm He's happy. like, "How do you milk a goat?" Um. Anyways, <laughs> I mean, what do you? So, like, is there is there advice that you can give out there to like you know songwriters, young songwriters, absolutely engineers? I mean, like artists as a whole, I, I th- like to be creative and they don't like to pay attention to business. Yes, they don't have a brain for it sometimes. All I can tell you is, no one's going to give a shit about your business more than you are. So even if you hire the best business, I mean, shit, Billy Joel had a great business manager who happened to be his brother-in-law who ripped him off for $30 million. If you're not paying attention, someone else will be. Right. And how many things have you come across that you find on the internet and everything else? Like- oh, I mean, just recently I got a check-in from, from well, we'll leave the label nameless for the moment, but a check-in for something that I produced in 2007. And I realized by looking at this check that... Like a physical check, like yeah. a check check. And, and a statement as well. But by analyzing both of these items, it became clear to me that this was the very first time they sent out a royalty statement. They had never paid me before. In 11 years. In 11 years. And here's the messed up part. EMI was well aware of it 11 years ago when I did the work. I turned in what's called a... Um, uh, a registration sheet to let them know that this was coming out on this label at this time and that they should track it. Wouldn't you think somebody from EMI uh, fucking track it? Would have gone after this money in the because it's money for them too, isn't it? it, it yeah, absolutely. There was we're talking about roughly thirty thousand dollars. That's enough in my mind for somebody at EMI to get yeah. off their ass and have gone to collect in the last eleven years. Instead of just showing up 11 years later with no one questioning where it was. And didn't you find like so, like one of your out records in French or something like that when... <sighs> so like he's like researching I mean, himself. I mean, I mean, there's a lot of stuff here that like people like like don't realize. It's like, oh, we, yeah. what, what was Searching for Sugar Man? Mm-hmm. Those guys were making money off of that album for years. This guy, Rodrigo's, Rodriguez never knew. Well, th- because was it was in a different con- or different language, he didn't know until he like came across it online. I, the- I went to. I've, I've had a lot of hits in Korea, a lot of hits, north or south. <laughs> south. <laughs> I don't think there are any. The only type of hits in, in North Korea are ones that I don't want because it leave bruises. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> the um, there's a group over there called Shiny. Um, tons of people. Um, Long story short, I decided to go into the Korean equivalent of ASCAP, uh, which is called Kamka, and it's all in Korean. Um, And fortunately, using a translation program separately, I was able to search my name in Kamka, come up with all these titles um, that have nothing to do with the English title, they're they're new titles, Um, do some translation. And one particular song that I wrote, I found out... um, there was a, a someone I've never heard of in my life. Uh, but I, I normally when you have a song done in Korean or any other language, you break off a piece for the translator right. that's agreed to. In this instance, there was the translator on there, but there was also somebody else who had an equal share of the song that I've never heard of in my life. Then I found one song that I absolutely wrote because Jamie was on it, but I wasn't on it. Somebody else was. The fact that you even have to do your own research is Yeah, I mean, isn't that what a publishing company's for? One Believable. Would 
but I mean, so how much money about, are you owed? Like exactly, if 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 twenty, if you're taking a shot in the dark right now, how much money do you take that information? I have no idea. Try to go after them, or of course, I report. I I go to the the legal team at EMI and go, hey, you guys are missing this. So you're getting screwed when you get paid. But doesn't you're not getting paid? Job, of course. But like I said, when I started this, no one's going to pay attention to your money like you are. You can put them on the case, but they're not going to go looking for this shit. It's too tedious. The fact that you even have to get a translator and look at, I mean, that's insane. That's insane. How many countries did you end up um, having hits for? I oh. know you've had a lot, but like there's like a number or something I read on one of your. I honestly don't know. I thought it was like 13 or Might something. Be. Where's, where's your work now? Like uh, what's like what do you what's current like what's like I mean I've been doing a lot of work for Disney lately which has been cool um, because Disney has the because, Mouse House right yeah because they have so many integrated working parts um, you they're know huge they're huge and they're making yeah. plenty of money off of the television side and off the film side where they can afford to do music properly. Whereas a lot of the music labels have dropped their budgets significantly to, you know, go along with the, the reduced rates that they're earning. Um, I've done stuff for the Descendants uh, soundtrack and for Zombies, uh, the, the movie that they just did. And I've been doing some work. I've got some work coming out on the upcoming uh, an episode of um, uh, Raven's Home, which is one of their TV shows. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, a little bit. I mean, um, how many how many songs did you write for that? For Raven, um, and we'll find out if this remains after this point in time. It's because the NDA is not in effect. Um, <laughs> otherwise, there'll be a jump cut right Just here. Just say it in a different language. Like um, <laughs> no, no, I mean, it, it, like, I mean the Raven's so they're episode. They're, they're doing an episode that the is a musical episode. Yeah, I don't um, want to give away plot or anything. Right. I just want to... And in that episode, there's 13 musical cues that are partial or half songs um, that we were asked to to work on. Now, for people out there who don't understand whether, whether you know, like, I've been working on this album for a year. Yeah, what was your what, time what frame? What was your time frame to do these 13 songs? The time frame was insane. Um from and the moment you get the call and they're like, all right, we're a go yeah, to from, delivery. Yeah. And I don't think we knew what the time frame was. They were just like, get it done as fast as you can. Yeah. Um, but and they give you the script. Yeah, we had the script. We had breakdowns in each song of what they were supposed to be about and, you know, general ideas of what tempo they wanted them to be in or feel. Right. Um, but long story short, I think between somewhere in like January 17th to February 13th, however many days that I is, what is it like? 13 plus uh, another 13 is like 26 days. So yeah. 26 days we had written, rewritten, made more changes and rewritten again and then recorded demos and ultimately recorded the cast in those 26 days. Now, is this Saturdays and Sundays off? Yes. Well, Saturdays and Sundays off for recording, not off as far as writing. us writing. Yeah, no, we were working around every day. I is mean... That like, is that like shut your fucking phone off? Like... Um, I'm just wondering, like, how high yes stress no. of a situation it, oh, it's, is. Oh, it's it's stress. It's like uh, 24 hours. It's like being at the <laughs> restaurant with the, with your kids and working on lyrics on the phone and having your kids go, "Come on, we want to go." And I'm like, "Hang on, I just need a few more minutes." Really? Yeah, it was it was pretty nuts. But it, that's how it is all the time, though, right? It but can that's be. like how professionals. You know, I mean that, and then they pay when, you when a when thousand. You're absorbed, I mean, <laughs> when you're absorbed in a project and there's deadlines, you do what you got to do to get through. It's no different than the film industry or anything else, or you know. Yeah, but you're turning lemonade into duct tape. True. <laughs> but I guess that's what makes you the professional. Wait, lemonade, lemonade into, into duct tape. tape. Yeah, like making the impossible happen. We do that all the time. Who has? Have you ever heard lemonade into duct tape? Because it seems impossible until you have Stacey's to do it. She's creating her own. I <laughs> use it on set. I use it on set all the time. You're lemonade into like, duct tape. Yeah. yeah, because you're everybody People turns. Who live in glass she's coining her own phrases. <laughs> I've never heard lemonade into duct tape I'm, because I'm it's something that ball. shouldn't happen. But like you mm. make something impossible happen. People who live in glass houses shouldn't throw chickens. <laughs> <laughs> Thunk. Oh my god! Lemonade into duct tape. 
And Whatever. Here's that jump. I get, I get, the, I get Whatever. the gist of it. But I mean, could the same thing be saying you're turning lemonade into a casserole? Sure. Okay. So you can make it I whatever you want. Um, a skateboard. I don't give a. <laughs> what do you, wouldn't you rather say turning a piece of coal into a diamond? No, because in the news business, when I was directing, I we always said turn lemonade into duct tape because they wanted. Was duct they tape wanted was duct tape this imagine? Uh, wait, 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 wait! You just missed something. Excuse me. Whoa! Yeah. Go back. Coal into no, no, diamond. No, 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 don't, tell don't. What was the question you asked? It's not I don't entirely know if... possible or impossible to cur- turn coal into diamond. It's, it's just you need to compress it super much to get. Oh yeah, it. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. pressure. Well, yes. Yes. I thought you were talking about. Like, That's not as impossible as press. lemon lemons into duct tape. No, because lemon into lemon is easy. You just go sh- like. Right. This isn't my, about me. We're supposed to be talking well, about let, him. But let me ask you this: Was duct tape <laughs> something that was like held up a high? In, no, in it was just because in, it was in, something. We have all these lemons, but we just need duct tape. Listen, in the news business, when <laughs> you're really broadcasting, like you had to make the impossible happen, and like you thought it was impossible, but you had to figure out a way to make it happen. I get, I get the analogy. Well, he it's keeps. Just, it just seems like duct tape was the weird. Yeah. Place I have used that on set when we're filming a few times. I and think and I you need to have and you a go podcast with other people from the, for being on set and see if they understood. He what just you're doesn't saying. listen to me at all. People in the news business that I've worked with would totally understand. I it might have been one of those like I don't think she's right, but I don't feel like correcting her for right. people. Oh, so you let me continue to do it? No. No, but it makes sense to people in the news business. It's it, but it doesn't so make what? sense to me. I could see a well, gaffer saying, you well, know, if it doesn't yes, make sense, maybe. if it doesn't make sense, then you're making something happen that should be impossible. Like if, ga- if like if, like this if, is like, like if, not if, like it. it like this is way bigger. Like, it's like turning lemons into gaff tape. Right. That, that makes sense. I get that. He it's like turning tape. this podcast into this. Yeah. <laughs> it shouldn't. This is ridiculous. <laughs> so, Stacy, I'll write a blog. Back on, lay back on the couch. We're going to talk about this. Oh my god. <laughs> so, what's in the future for you? Oh, um, just I'm, like that. I'm going to produce a line of T-shirts that say "Turning Lemonade into Duct Tape." <laughs> hey, it, I want a, I want more than a thousandth of a penny. What we'll, did I do? We'll what give did you I... one eleventh. Listen. <laughs> That could make something. I'm serious because it's stupid. So it will probably take off. What did I tell you about ball busting? I don't have balls. No, like <laughs> you don't have duct tape either. What, well, as long as everyone's busting your balls, they love you. Okay. Just, what what was just, the? Uh, I'm just letting you know. It's because I'm a woman, was it isn't it? Jessica Simpson. <laughs> it was chicken of the chicken sea. Of chicken of the, the sea. Tuna. Yeah, yeah. And tuna. It was uh, chicken tuna of was the, the sea. Chicken of the sea. Yeah. I forget what the whole thing is, but the thing I remember about her was she. She, goes, she didn't know if it was chicken or tuna. Oh, that's right. But but, she, but there was another it line looks from the that same. show. <laughs> it was. It was. Uh, she goes. She goes. I'm. I'm almost twenty five, and that and that's almost halfway to thirty. I yeah. remember that. Wow. And Marky bought me all of those seasons on DVD for Christmas this past year. Really? Yes, I did, Jimmy. Because I care so, about people around. Now that like you said first... that, <laughs> is there I some, used to watch those. some hidden? So you do watch reality TV? No, like no, no I watched right around ones. like the Real World, and then when everybody I loved the Real it, World. It got terrible. I love the Real World. Um, what are you working on? That, so what's next? Uh, or what? More, more, more work for Disney. Um, things that I can't talk about, but I will be traveling. Are they good partners? They're really good. Um. I the thing I enjoy about them is the executives that I've had the pleasure of working with know what they're talking about, much more so than a lot of the executives in the music industry. Um, <laughs> I, I can't tell you the number of times I've been in an A and R meeting where someone will say something like, um, "Yeah, I don't know exactly what I'm looking for, but I'll know it when I hear it." I'm oh, like, Jesus, so that, we're that like, what, 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 what are you looking for for uh, Ricky Martin as an example? Oh, I'm. Up tempo, but uh, something different. But I'm not exactly sure what it is yet. Uh, when I hear it, I'll know it. Okay. What color do you want to use? I don't know, but I'll I'll know it when I see it. But then I see feel like they throw so much at you. Like I want some Tupac with some, you know, Whitney Houston but, but and he Fall Out Boy. That, he I know. That language. Yeah, no, I understand that. But sometimes even I'm trying to like I'll be like trying to even find. Well, you and I had a talk about this the other day where I'm like, is it very hard to get notes or is it very hard to understand what people are talking about? Because It depends you, on who it is. When you think of an executive, you don't think of somebody who's versed in, in, in uh, music or speaks I'll your give language. You, I'll give you a short story. When I, I, one of the other things I did along the way in uh, 95 was uh, Carney Wilson had a talk show. Right. And I was fortunate I enough to, to – I did the theme for it, which right. was great. It was a network 
um, show and it got played a lot and it earned quite a bit of money. Um, on the way to getting that theme, I had interactions with the head of, of the company. Um, and this gentleman said to me, we want the theme to be funky, funky theme, instrumental funky. And at the time in 95, to me, what instrumental funky went was like in living color. Yeah. That was what was out. So I did a couple different themes and every time I'd send them to him, he would come back and be like, no, it's not funky. Don't you know what funky is? And I'm like, yeah, I know what funky is. I hate that word. (laughs) We're talking down to a musician. So yeah. (laughs) We did a couple more themes. Are you no. fucking stupid? And finally, basically, he was like, you know, are you fucking stupid, basically? Really? Like, he didn't say that, but he might as well have. He was like, D- you obviously don't know what funky is. And I said, well, I guess I don't. You know, why, tell me, what, what's your definition of funky? He's like, come on, man. Funky, like the Cosby theme. Oh. <laughs> and in that moment, I went, uh, and I also went, ding, 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 ding. Dude's talking about jazz. <laughs> Sir, <laughs> if you think about the Cosby theme, it's a jazz yes. theme. Did you to him, even dance that? He to was him, like a clarinet. Right. That's what funky was to him. That's funny. So I learned at that moment that somebody who's not versed in music doesn't use the same terms I'm going to use, and I need to ask a lot more questions. So I wouldn't have had to have possibly written those other three versions. Wow. Never trust somebody who says funky. <laughs> but the, the folks at Unless Disney. It's rest of development. If you're yeah. Okay. And the fo- did we lose a camera? Who cares? Okay. The folks at Disney have been great. We don't have sponsors, Jack. Who gives a shit? That's all right. <laughs> so, Jimmy, do you want to sing Hey Santa now? Since uh... <laughs> Yeah. Will you allow him to do a cover of... Sure. Will you dress there up you as go. Santa Claus for the music video? No, we'll get Lee. <laughs> oh, but come on. You'd have the original. All right, so what you're saying? Uh, no, I was just saying the, the folks at Disney have been great because they, they actually know what they're talking about. They give a lot of pointed direction. And at the end of the day, they want to keep the project moving forward. That's awesome, dude. Mm-hmm. I'm so I, everything. Do you think? Do you think that like you're you're you you've, you've always been on an upward trajectory? Where it's like, I think so. I think like I'm not really at a low point. You know, I think we. I think everybody in this industry hits cycles. Yeah. There's up cycles and down cycles. Um, when you're on an up cycle, if you have some success, you can ride that success for a solid two years on your way to more success and if you don't have more success you'll hit the down cycle um i'd I'd like to believe i'm on an up cycle again i've certainly so you'll go back to the grammys because you'll be nominated again hopefully if or maybe like maybe i can't go if i'm not nominated it's not the same for you to win both how do we get you an egot Mm, an ingot or an egot egot we'll have to figure it out nothing to do with lemonade and duct tape though (laughs) So uh, uh, we're gonna come out and see you soon. Cool. And uh, maybe we can get. We got him to come to Scranton. Come, come, freak come, of the week to come. Uh, yeah. yeah. To one of his idols. I, that would be. That awesome. would be amazing. That would be awesome. You would. Lit- I've never seen him fangirl. I kind of want to see him do it. His his reaction to Hey Santa, learning about that though, like I saw it on the corner of my eye. I didn't see it. I know. Wait for the edited version. Yeah, behind you, he looked like it was like it was like somebody who just found out that. What were you like eleven when it came out? (laughs) (laughs) Me too. (laughs) So was I. Yeah. Um, I want to thank you for your time so much. You've been incredibly gracious, and and I know that we're all appreciative, and I and I and I hope that you don't think I was picking your brain about tons of stuff and I don't think we've asked any salacious stories or anything like that prior to this podcast and we don't we don't look forward to doing that we want to we want to know who you are as the man and the <laughs> professional and the thanks for coming the to guy Scranton a great hugger um and then and we're going to breakfast with him at this great place when we go out there what was the name of it remember we went oh um not that griddle place, which place was it? it was on it was on I think it was on Ventura Oh, you're talking about... Um, was it the bowling alley one? No, no, no. No, no, no. no, no. The place, we, we sit outside? Yeah, we sat outside. On the on the sidewalk? Yeah. Yeah, uh, there's something cafe, the... Griddle cafe? No. no. It was like a big pancake or something. Like somebody was like... Yeah, they had pancakes. Uh, the, the, yeah, it was the best pancakes. I the, thought the, that was the griddle No, no, cafe. next to the DJ was the uh, obscene pancakes. Yeah. yeah the that, griddle was the obscene one. I didn't go huge. with you guys for that. That was terrible. This was the something cafe. I can't think of it right now, but... All right, we're going again. We'll go again. Let's Jack, do it. thank you so much for thank being you. here. Thank you. Thank you.